Ibu Patel is founder of the Interfaith Youth Corps. He tells his own story about being a Muslim and an American. Next, his new book, Acts of Faith. This is about an hour, ten minutes. Really, what populates her book so beautifully are all these stories of not just people, but, you know, sort of there's James Baldwin, there's Gwendolyn Brooks, there's William Blake, Walt Whitman, all these people come in. Can you talk a little bit about where all of these literary influences came from in your life? Well, I think that literally in, literary influences first come for many people from being lonely. So when you're a kid, you're lonely, so what do you do? You read, and you populate your world with, with, uh, with with all of these other voices. And then you begin to bounce your ideas off of these voices. And what, what one tries to do, I think, is to weave together a tapestry of these different voices, right? This is one of the reasons, I mean, I, in, I, I think of it kind of like being a DJ. What does a DJ do? The, uh, a DJ takes little pieces of music from multiple types of music and strings them together into something that's different and oftentimes just pops a little bit of their own original stuff in between. I think that's a lot of what people's lives are like and I think in some way I try to write this book in that way as stringing together those types of stories in a way that feels like the jazz and war of living a life. Right, and there's so much sort of unexpected, syncopated kind of stuff that happens. Um, I love the way that you talk about the people who have influenced you. And there's just one part where you um, talk about uh, Brother Wayne. And I just want you to tell us a little bit about him. You describe him somewhere else as like this. You say, um, Brother Wayne Teasdale was like a character out of a movie, a cross between Zorba the Greek, St. Francis of Assisi, and the mad scientist from the Back to the Future series. <laughs> and I think that's so wonderful. Can you talk a little bit about him and how he sort of moved you along your way, your journey? You know, I, I'm just going to read just a little bit of um... Of, of this piece on Brother Wayne to begin with. Yeah. Uh, this is the beginning of chapter four in this book, and it goes, Brother Wayne Teasdale had two great hopes for me, that I would start an interfaith youth movement and that I would take mushrooms with him. <laughs> he got one. <laughs> I met Brother Wayne in the spring of 1997. In addition to being a Catholic monk, Brother Wayne had a PhD in philosophy and had spent years at an ashram in India where he took vows in a Hindu monastic tradition. He was also on the board of the Council for a Parliament of the World's Religions. Come see me in Hyde Park, he said when we met. I jumped at the chance. And Brother Wayne really was, like for me, the mad scientist in the Back to the Future movies. Uh, I would go down to Hyde Park once every couple of weeks with my best friend, then a Jewish poet, Kevin Koval, who's still my best friend now. And we would literally sit at this guy's feet, and he would, um, he would tell us stories. And the thing about Brother Wayne is that the character he was in his stories was also the character he was in real life. So we would go for these walks. He would tell us about how spiritual animals were in a very Francis of Assisi way. And we would go for walks, and he would see literally like a stray cat or dog somewhere, and he would stop, and he would like focus on the cat, and then he would look at Kevin and me, and he'd be like, that is a very spiritual cat. <laughs> and you know, Kevin and I were like, we were like 21 years old, hair on fire, you know, head full of radical spangles, and we're like, is this guy for real? And Brother Wayne's like, he studied in India. It has to be for real. You know, that's, that's how we kind of saw things. Um, but Brother Wayne had this deep, wild, loving hope and trust in young people, and it came from nothing fact-based. It was not reality-based at all. I don't know if that man knew what reality was. Um, it, it came from, from spirit, and he gave that to me. And so when he would say to me, Ibu, in the way you know, he would focus on these spiritual cats, he'd be like, Ibu, I think you will start an interfaith youth movement. <laughs> I was like, Maybe I believe that. You know? And I, I feel like all, right. all young people need those people in their lives. They need people who will irrationally believe in them. Um, the other thing that I found so fascinating was Brother Rain told you that you should go see the Dalai Lama. Now, I find this incredible. How, how does a kid from Glen Ellen end up 
sort of in sort of having a private, intimate conversation with the Dalai Lama. I mean, I couldn't even buy, you know, scalped tickets from StubHub when he was here in Millennium <laughs> Park, right? Could you talk a little bit about that journey to go see the Dalai Lama? Well, this is part of the magic of Brother Wayne, um, who incidentally, uh, sadly, died a few years ago. Um, and one of the reasons I, I keep telling stories about him is because it makes him feel alive to me. You know, um, but Brother Wayne had a very close friendship with the Dalai Lama's brother and took care of the Dalai Lama's nephew when he was a student at Northwestern and developed a, a, a really interesting Catholic Buddhist dialogue with His Holiness himself and was totally generous about it. I mean, a lot of people are like, hey, you know, I know the chairman of this company, but I'm not going to give you his email. Brother Wayne was like, I'll call the Dalai Lama and get you a meeting. You know, it was a totally different reaction, a totally different kind of cosmology. Um, and so when he found out that Kevin and I had taken really seriously this idea that there really needs to be an interfaith youth movement. And why? Uh, because in Brother Wayne's belief, young people were, in, were because in, in some way, because they were closer to their birth, they were closer to the breath of God, I think, in Brother Wayne's cosmology in some way, and also because, you know, I think Brother Wayne was a little frustrated with uh, a lot of the senior theological reflection that was happening in interfaith, in the interfaith movement at the time, and not as much action as Brother Wayne would want. Uh, and he really thought that young people would be what he would call the prophetic voice of that. So when Kevin and I began taking that very seriously, Brother Wayne wanted to do everything in his power to make that happen. And he knew that we were going to India uh, to spend time with my grandmother, and he said, listen, Go to Dharamsala, and I'll get you a 15-minute audience with His Holiness. And, you know, we, we arrive in Dharamsala after a harrowing bus journey, during which I think I've, I've never prayed more intensely uh, than on an Indian bus for nine hours. And we, you, you know, we arrive at the guest house of the Tibetan government in exile, and uh, one of the innkeepers is like, yeah, Richard Gere was here a week ago. <laughs> Kevin and I are like, which bed was he in? You know? um, and we spent two weeks there, and we played a lot of basketball with the Dalai Lama's bodyguards, who never call a traveling violation, ever. Um, and we had a, an amazing, profound, spiritual 15 minutes with the Dalai Lama, during which I couldn't believe Kevin's chutzpah. You know, he, he, he opens this theological conversation on angels in Judaism and angels in Buddhism with the Dalai Lama and on the idea of emptiness and the idea of Buddhism. And I'm like, why aren't you stunned silent like me? You know? <laughs> and then after about 10 minutes of, of, of the Dalai Lama and Kevin talking about Judaism, the Dalai Lama turns to me and says, so you're a Muslim. And I was like, I, I was about to tell you about how I was trying to practice Buddhist prayer. <laughs> that doesn't seem to be like what you want to hear about. And then he kind of repeats again, so you're a Muslim. And I didn't really answer at that time. I was, you know, I was trying to figure out where I stood vis-a-vis -vis the story of Islam. Uh, and then he told this story of several centuries ago, one of his predecessor Dalai Lamas had looked out of his palace in Lhasa in Tibet and had seen a man climb to the top of the mountain and do the Muslim Salat, the, uh, the chanting, the recitation, the bending, um, the kneeling, the sijda. And he called the man to him. And he said, what are you doing? And the man said, I'm a Muslim, and I'm praying. And the Dalai Lama said, is it a requirement of your religion that you pray on this hilltop? And the man said, well, no, but I want it to be as close to God as possible. And this is the highest place that I can find. And there is no mosque for me here. And the Dalai Lama said, where did your people come from? And this Muslim man talked about how uh, Muslims had been traders in Tibet kind of coming through and selling their goods and their wares for some time, and a small community had settled there. And the Dalai Lama said, well, tell me about your religion. And the Muslim talked about, you know, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, uh, talked about the, the, the core of Islam being about the breath of God within each human being. And that Dalai Lama listened and said, well, it sounds like our religions are profoundly similar. And he sent one of his archers to that hilltop. And the archer sent one arrow in each of the four directions. And the Dalai Lama said, that will be the borders of the Muslim community in Tibet. And you will always be safe here. And you will always be welcomed here. Wow. And so His Holiness told me that story as you know, kind of like a, <laughs> an introduction to, or a continuing of, of a friendship of centuries long between the Dalai Lamas and Muslims. Mm -hmm. Now, you also mentioned um, 
Catholicism. And somebody who sort of is throughout the book is Dorothy Day and the Catholic mm -hmm. Workers Movement. Um, did you build the interfaith movement sort of around that model, or what was her importance to you? Well, and I'll answer that question in two ways. I'll answer the, the personal side of the question first, which is what, what role did Dorothy Day play in my life, and at what point did she come in? Mm -hmm. and, and the second is, to what extent has what she did with the Catholic worker influenced the way we've tried to build the interfaith youth core? Um, so in, really, in the middle of my rage in college, when I was 18 and 19 years old, and it got to the point where my dad was like, listen, uh, don't, come home, don't come home for winter vacation anymore if all you're going to do is call me bourgeois. Like, that, that, <laughs> word, that word is not allowed in the house anymore. And uh, if you keep calling it to Sounds me, you can, find, right, you can find another bourgeois father to pay your college tuition. Right. Because <laughs> guess what? It's not free, you know? Um, and I, I had fallen in uh, uh, at my alma mater uh, at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, when I was there in the early 90s. I'd fallen in with, with groups of very politically radical people whose worldview made some sense to me. You know, basic questions like, tell me, why is it that some people have four houses and some people are homeless? And I didn't have a good answer to that question. I, I still don't have a very good answer to that question. Um, but their response to those questions was rage. And their response was shouting. And their response was, the more you pound this into people, the better chance you have of the world changing. And after a couple of weeks of that, I was like, I'm not, I'm not really sure I really see the world changing. I see myself losing a lot of friends. Not really sure I see the world changing. Um, and somebody told me, you got to learn about the Catholic worker movement. And I asked what that was. And they said, well, it's, it's uh, part home for Catholics who want to live in the footsteps of Jesus. It's part place for anarchists with a deeply compassionate spirit. And it's partially one of the most interesting movements of the 20th century. And you just have to go there to know. And uh, there happened to be a Catholic worker house at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. And I went there on a Sunday morning. Um, and I, I've never encountered another place like that in my entire life, which was you, I couldn't tell the people who were supposedly the clients or the people who needed the help and the people who were, quote unquote, offering the help. I mean, the big idea of the Catholic worker was that people who had privilege um, gave up their privilege proactively in order to live in solidarity with people who went without. Because the notion wasn't that you start social service centers. The notion was that you start communities where human beings could be as human as possible together. And there's this great line by June Jordan that the Catholic worker makes me think about. She says, I am a stranger learning to worship the strangers around me. Mm -hmm. right? And I saw that at the Catholic worker. And it felt so palpably different than the political radical movements I was a part of. It felt so palpably different than my Marxist professors with you know, 49 minute lectures on the problems of American capitalism who would then stroll easily by homeless people on the street. And I just, I couldn't, I couldn't put those things together. And then at the Catholic Worker they said, here is our philosophy. We should live in solidarity with people who are poor because that is the way Jesus lived. And then they lived it. And when I was 19, that meant that that, that made eminent sense to me. Mm -hmm. You believe something, and so you do it. Done. And it made so much sense to me that, that uh, I spent the summer after my second year in college traveling through Catholic worker houses around the country. And I kept on asking these people, you know, why do you do what you do? How is it that you have a, a, a graduate degree from an elite university, and you're, you are begging for food from warehouses so that you can put together a decent soup kitchen tonight for people in the neighborhood who are homeless. And they just kept on saying, God, it's God. And they didn't say it in, a, in kind of the, the sin and salvation kerosene of the religious right. And they didn't say it in this way of like, well, you have to be a part of what we think is the most important religious identity uh, in the world. It was just, this is where we come from, and this is why we do what we do. And if you ask us, we're going to tell you. Mm -hmm. um, now, what you said so resonates with me, obviously, because I've been spending a lot of time with Jane Addams. And clearly, when she founded the Hull House Settlement, there was a very similar instinct to live with the people in solidarity. Um, but something you said 
also ruffled me as a Marxist professor, <laughs> which is um, that you know something that Jane Addams sort of has taught us too is that you know we have to live with the contradictions. Like in some way, you know, sort of the purity and asceticism of saying, "Well, I'm going to then disavow X, Y, and Z," is a very simple answer. And I'm just wondering how, in your movement, um, you know, what have you taken from Catholic workers, and what have you pieced right. together from your bourgeois existence and things like that. <laughs> Uh, right. Yeah, I'll tell you something. <laughs> well, I, I'm laughing because um, my, my first foray into starting something that resembled the Catholic Worker House is called the Stone Soup Cooperative. I know. I couldn't believe which, that uh, you were associated with that. Yeah. It's like a mythical place. Yeah. And then yeah. you see me in suits these days. <laughs> Back I then, I wore burlap bags and I dumpstered my food. Uh, my wife is like, thank God we didn't meet then. Can, can you tell people a little bit just who aren't familiar with the Stone Soup Collective, right. what that is? Sure. Well, the Stone Soup Cooperative was, uh, uh, was something that a group of young people in Chicago and I started in 1997. And it, it, it came out of a set of potlucks. And the big idea was, you know, it was January 1997. There were a handful of us in the city who were social justice activists of some form or another. I was a teacher in an alternative school. There were people who were social workers. There were people who were community organizers. And we needed a place where we could get together and kind of hang out that didn't cost a million dollars a night, because we didn't have a million dollars a night. So I hosted a small potluck at my place in early January of 1997. And the next week it doubled. And the week after that it doubled. And the week after that it doubled. And there was a time when there was like 140 people kind of spilling out of my one and a half bedroom apartment on Clybourne Avenue on uh, uh, the kind of this no man's land between Lincoln Park and Logan Square. And at some point, I think I said, you know what this is reminding me of? It's reminding me of the Catholic worker movement. It's reminding me of a place where people um, who have a kind of a core idea, which is how do you improve the general welfare, which is you know, the core idea that Saul Alinsky articulated. It's those people coming together in community in order, in order to both kind of rejuvenate themselves and to learn so that when they go back out into the world, they can do it in a more engaged and, and a more effective way. And somebody was like, well, you know, if other people can form a community based on a, a core principle, why can't we do it? And we were 22, 21, 22 at the time. We were crazy enough to try anything, and so we tried it. And literally, we first potluck was in January of 1997, and we moved in to the convent at uh, the Lady of Lords Parish on the north side of Chicago on Ashland Avenue in September. Right, I read that Kathy Kelly sort of hooked you up. Kathy that Kelly, place, that's right. right. You know, <laughs> Kathy Kelly came came over one night and said, "This is the most hopeful thing that I've seen in a long time. It's a group of young people who are all social justice activists who want to live in community based on the, the principle of solidarity and rejuvenation and compassion. And I want to help you with that. And I know this this priest at Our Lady of Lords Parish and." There's a convent there that, that is effective, that it's not full. There are very few nuns there, and he might be interested in renting it out. And actually, that priest took a major risk, Father Lambert. Um, I think we were the first non-Catholic group in Chicago to, and the first lay group, not even non-Catholic, but you know, not of any type of core religious community at all, to rent from the archdiocese. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it's interesting, when we had our first meeting with him, you know, he asked, are you guys Catholic? And we said, no. And are you religious? And we said, no. And, and I thought to myself, actually, I am a little bit religious. But <laughs> I, I find it very hard to say that. And then I thought to myself, why is it that every time I see somebody talking about religion, they're the nutsos. But people who are becoming religious like me around an orientation of mercy and compassion and are finding mentors like Brother Wayne and are uh, taking people like Dorothy Day as their hero, why don't we have a language of faith? Why aren't we talking about what it means to be religious? And in a lot of ways, the germination of the Interfaith Youth Corps was from some of those meetings. And you know, one of the reasons, one of the, the, the roles that Stone Soup plays in this is, again, for a young person, 21, 22, at the time, the, I had a really rosy look at the world. I had an idea in January of 1997, and in September of 1997, it was a reality. And I thought to myself, well, all ideas must work like this. You have an idea, you meet a couple of, Kathy Kelly comes into your life, Brother Wayne comes into your life, 
they had yeah, Fathom Lambert and get a couple million dollars. And, <laughs> and, 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 but that was my orientation right. to the world. Well, you know, when I started the Interfaith Youth Corps and I went to foundation program officers for the first four years and they looked at me like I was a little nuts, I, that, was, that was a different, uh, a little bit of a reality check. I, I, I should say that not all foundation program officers looked at me like that. And, and I'm, I'm really glad that, that my program officer from the McCormick Tribune Foundation, John Syrick, is in the room because when I first met with him, he was like, this is a really creative idea. And I don't know how we're going to make it happen, but we'll make it happen. Why don't we go to what the core principle of the Interfaith Youth Corps is? Can you just sort of help us understand sure. what that principle is? Well, we, we have kind of a big idea of the world. Um, and you know, maybe what I'll do here is I'll just, I'll just read what I think is the, the core idea of our view of the world and our work is in one paragraph in this book. And maybe I'll just read that directly. Um, 100 years ago, the great African-American scholar W.E.B. Du Bois famously said, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. I believe that the 21st century will be shaped by the problem of the faith line. On one side of the faith line are the religious totalitarians. Their conviction is that only one interpretation of one religion is a legitimate way of being, believing, and belonging on earth. Everyone else needs to be cowed or converted or condemned or killed. On the other side of the faith line are the religious pluralists who hold that people believing in different creeds and belonging to different communities need to learn to live together. Religious pluralism is neither mere coexistence nor forced consensus. It is a form of proactive cooperation that affirms the identity of the constituent communities while emphasizing that the well-being of each and all depends on the health of the whole. So that's our kind of our big picture of the world is, is either we're going to build societies where people from different backgrounds can live in equal dignity and mutual loyalty, and we call that pluralism, or we are going to watch people we call religious totalitarians win. And their big idea is that only their group should dominate and every other group should suffocate. Mm -hmm. right? And our notion of the faith line is that the vast majority of humanity has not actively chosen a side. They, they are standing on the faith line. They incline towards pluralism because I think that's the nature of human existence. We want to be with people, whether they are people only like us or whether they're people who are different from us. They incline towards pluralism. But I believe that there are not strong enough institutions, strong enough forces on, who are articulating a clear and compelling case for pluralism. And what the dangers of the alternative to pluralism is, we are not bringing those people to our side in a, in a shout out loud, we believe in these type of societies and we will stand up and build them with you. And I think that the most powerful people on the faith line are young people. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I believe that is because every time you see somebody killing somebody to the soundtrack of prayer, it's a young person. Religious extremism is a movement of young people taking action, right? Young people can be very powerful as destroyers. Young people can also be very powerful as creators. And so if you look across the 20th century, so many of the movements who have helped create more just and compassionate societies were founded by young people of faith with a focus on religious pluralism. Well, can I ask you a question about that? Because I guess I'm wondering about pluralism. Um, I think in general, it might be a great idea, but in, when you talk about particulars, can all ideas that perhaps contradict each other coexist? Um, for example, if I believe that it's never right to torture somebody, never, and someone else believes that in certain conditions it might be okay to torture somebody. Um, you know, how can we create a sort of pluralistic society and me live in close contact and I mutual respect when I actually just don't respect that idea at all? What's interesting to me about that question is that your articulation of that is, is a reverse articulation of what you asked me 10 minutes ago, mm -hmm. which was, but don't you think that some religious ways of being that attempt to to combine a philosophy with, with a set of actions which are entirely consistent, that type of purity 
isn't that impossible to get at precisely because life is about contradictions. And now you're asking me, but isn't, how do we live with those contradictions? Well, not all contradictions are created equally. I would say that too. And also right. I get to ask the question, so I can contradict myself right. as much Great. as I want. <laughs> right. This is Ibu Patel. You're not allowed right. to do that, right? <laughs> um, there are the, pe the people on the other side of the faith line, the people we cannot tolerate are totalitarians. Mm -hmm. okay. So if there is somebody who believes in torture and wants to take that to court, I will go to court with that person and argue it out and pray that I win. I will not try to kill that person. And if that person who believes in torture attempts to torture me into submission or suffocation, then that person is a totalitarian and has walked themselves out of the pale. But the truth is, we live in a country in which people have very different beliefs and opinions than you or I. And I think the highest value in a world in which diff people of different backgrounds are not only killing each other, but are being convinced that the only way that they can live in this world is to kill people from different backgrounds and ideas. I think what I am saying is my highest principle right now even higher than my progressivism, even higher than my commitment to certain communities, is the idea of pluralism. And, and as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, you know, from Isaiah Berlin, sometimes you have competing values, and sometimes you have to choose one value over another. And I think in the world in which we live in, in which we have a serious danger of civilizational war, and e even worse, a serious danger of people thinking that people from different backgrounds are inherently and inevitably at odds with each other, if we do not stand up for the idea that people from different backgrounds, sharply different ideologies, sharply different religious beliefs can and should live in the same national community in equal dignity and mutual loyalty, we are in deep trouble. Right. Now, one question I have is about why the faith line? Um, certainly, I think there are more people dying in this world from AIDS in Africa or um, from genocide in Rwanda. And I'm just wondering, um, why draw that line of faith and perhaps, I mean, just to sort of paraphrase Tom Frank and what's the matter with Kansas argument, you know, is perhaps the sort of religious conversation a red herring when what we really should be focusing on is sort of the growing disparity between, you know, people with wealth and people living under the poverty line um, and to sort of amend um, Du Bois and to sort of say, actually now we're dealing with the faith line, in some ways like hierarchy puts this religious struggle um, over all the other st social struggles that people are involved in. And so can you talk a little bit about why faith and not, for example, the borderline, which a lot of immigration activists are talking mm -hmm. about now? Sure. Um, first of all, I, I think one of the, the, when you're talking about how people build pluralism, a lot of times they build it on a common agenda or common actions. This is certainly the way we work at the Interfaith Youth Corps. And you know, this, is, this is kind of the, 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 the beginning and end of our work is how do you bring people from different religious communities together to do, to, to do something positive and concrete together? And incidentally, we have tons of this material in our, on our website at, at ifyc.org. And the idea is to focus on shared values, many of which are the social justice values that I think both you and I care about. The truth is that a lot of the people doing mo much of the most effective work on these social justice issues are people of faith. So AIDS in Africa was really brought to the fore by evangelical Christians, right? And right now, the environmental movement is being given a huge boost, not just by evangelicals, but what is emerging as a very interesting evangelical Muslim partnership, which the Interfaith Youth Corps is nurturing in, in a lot of ways on campuses across the country. People are, evangelicals are saying, listen, we think that from biblical truth, we are called to care from cre for creation. And Muslims are saying, well, in Surah 2 of the Holy Quran, we believe that, that God created Adam as his servant and representative, as his Abd and Khalifa on earth, and made him the steward of God's creation. And that's something we can work on together. So I don't think these things are mutually exclusive. But I want to get at a diff another dimension of your question, which is a lot of progressive activists of which it was a camp that I certainly was in both feet at a, at a different time in my life and, and, and uh, am in some relationship with now, thought that identity and multiculturalism was a hugely important thing 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. And there was a lot of 
th there was an enormously important discourse that emerged on race, class, gender, ethnicity, and sexuality identity. Right? And this is something that not only are you familiar with, Lisa, but I, I feel like you are a leader in, in creating spaces where people from these different backgrounds, often marginalized backgrounds, have a place to speak. Right? Well, what was the identity that wasn't engaged at all in that movement? It was religious identity. And so part of what I wanted to say to the multicultural movement is this is an identity that 90 plus percent of humanity not only views as important, but it's perhaps the most salient identity in their lives, their religious identity. Why is it that you left it out of the multicultural movement? Diana Eck, the Harvard professor, says it's the missing R of the multicultural movement. So what we're saying at the Interfaith Youth Corps, and I think more and more people are saying this, is you have to engage the fact of people's lives head on. And the fact of people's lives is that religious identity matters. And the fact of the world is that there are a lot of forces out there who are shaping religious identity in enormously destructive directions. And as somebody who is not just religious, but also wants to be a good citizen of America and the world, why would I forfeit one of the most powerful motivating forces in the world to the bad guys? Why would I not try to nurture a public discourse of, of religion that is positive, that is constructive, that leads towards pluralism, instead of saying, you know what, because religion isn't important in my life, and because I don't really know that much about it, it can't be that important to other people. And I, I kind of feel like that was, to some extent, the wrong rationale of a lot of the progressive multicultural movement. Right. I guess I would say that um, you know, our identities are sort of moving targets, right? In one moment, I might sit here as a sort of founder of the public square, and then in another moment, I might identify as a young Asian woman. In another moment, I would identify as someone who is you know, a peace activist. And so um, I, I definitely respect the fact that religious identity might be one aspect of it, but I just wonder also why um, why take the baggage of religious identity? I mean, I'm a person of great faith, too. I have faith that the world can be made a better place. I have faith that people can rise above selfishness. I just don't anchor my faith in religion, and I feel like the world could be created. You could have, where, where is the space for a secular humanism in sort of your interfaith conversations? I mean, you address it in your book a little bit, too. So. Right, well, I mean, it's, it's everywhere. It's right here, it's next to me, it's on the bus, it's uh, in Congress. Mm -hmm. You are absolutely free to be a secular humanist. I just wanna make sure that s secular humanism doesn't suffocate religious identity and, a, and, and, a, and a, a discourse in which people from multiple points of view, including religious points of view, have an opportunity to articulate who they are in public. So I, I, I think that, that at at the level of abstraction, there's a challenge. But at the level of actuality, there isn't a challenge because Lisa, you and I are friends and we have all types of conversations and I have never- games together. Right, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and I've never once said, well, Lisa, you know, the, the, the faith that I am a part of is the faith that you have to be a part of. And, and because, Lisa, I bought the Hitchens book and I gave oh, yeah. that man $25 <laughs> of my money he because, only gets like 250 of it. Oh or something, my god! So. <laughs> um, I'm going to comment sure. on the book given given your question. Uh, so Hitchens um, talks about King. And he effectively says King's a pretty good guy. I even get emotional sometimes when I listen to his sermons. Why do people want to make him religious? In fact. Kitchen says, you know, if, if he wasn't religious, he would have probably been a whole lot more effective. And I, I look at that as kind of a petri dish or, or a window into how some people are increasingly viewing religion. And I want to talk about this quickly at multiple levels and why I think it is both insulting and also ineffective. Here's why it's insulting. Because if somebody tells you that what is meaningful in their life is their grandmother, would you scoff at that? Would you say, well, grandmothers are very yesterday. And by the way, <laughs> grandmothers have done an enormous amount of, of, of horrible things on earth, right? <laughs> of course you wouldn't. So wh wh why, would you, why is it okay to take what is a core part of so many people's identity and desecrate it? 
That's the first, and particularly when a guy like King, you know, says over and over again, many people want to make of me many things. But let me tell you who I really am. I am the son of a Baptist minister, and I am the grandson of a Baptist minister, and I am the great-grandson of a Baptist minister, and I come from the belief that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, and that is the root and the source of my action. Right, but also remember, I mean, King almost got kicked out of the Southern Baptist Church because of his beliefs, and he had a lot of problems with organized religion also at the same time. So I guess, I, you know, part of it is I agree with you, and I also respectfully disagree in that sense. But, you know, we're almost out of time, but I do want you to read a section from your lovely book, and it, the part that I think is so beautiful is the section which really reads as a love poem to Chicago, and I'm hoping you can sort of share sure. that with us. I'm gonna make one comment on this organized religion thing first, because I just, because <laughs> <laughs> right, well, you, you can't, because you can't, because that lovely lead you can't, your love poem right, Chicago? But, but okay. for, for, first, first you poked me, right, right. and then you shook my ass. So I'm gonna go after the, okay. so, I mean, w one of the things we have to recognize about, of course, there are a lot of, of dimensions of religion and organized religion which are profoundly destructive and profoundly anti-pluralist. They're totalitarian in nature. That's the entire reason that we have put forth this idea of the faith line, because what it does is it allows you to dis make clear distinctions between, you know what, it's, we understand that it's okay that your cosmology and my cosmology are different, that your idea of heaven might be one thing and mine might be another thing. Right? That, doesn't, that doesn't put you and I on different sides of the faith line. But if you wanted to suffocate me because of my identity, that would put us on different sides. So what I'd like us to do is to just make sure that in our, in our understanding of the world, particularly religiously, we get the us and them right. The them is not organized religion. The them is not evangelicals. The them is not Orthodox Jews. The them is not traditionalist Muslims that them are people who, if they had power, would seek to dominate and suffocate you. And just because some of those people are a part of organized religion and use that language and use those symbols doesn't mean, I think, that we should paint the entire world of organized religion with that brush, which incidentally is precisely what they want to do. I mean, part of Part of what they, the reason that Al Qaeda, and I, I have this, I just did this piece for Slate, the reason that Al Qaeda chooses middle class Muslims as terrorists is precisely because they want to create the illusion of all Muslims being terrorists. Right? So if they take the most responsible members of a society and they say, see, these six doctors will blow you up, what they think you will do is say, oh my gosh, what is my Muslim doctor putting in the syringe? Right? And they are trying to create a sense of us and them that is Muslims against the world. Well, the truth is Muslims didn't go for it. You know, Bin Laden has been saying for years and years and years it is the duty of every Muslim to kill Americans and Westerners. Muslims didn't go for it. Let's not, from the other side, give Bin Laden a world against Muslims. Right. Or let's not, let's stop thinking in the dichotomies of us and thems and moving toward the we of the common good, right. which I think we would agree on. That's a wonderful segue <laughs> into, into a love song to Chicago. Okay. Chicago, a somber city. What was Saul Bellow talking about? I returned to an exuberant city, a blue-collar metropolis getting an artist's makeover, an American city taking its place in the world, a town unafraid to decorate cow statues and call it public art. <laughs> A city that was part Indiana and part Manhattan. It was a rich time to be back in Chicago. The Cubs, Sox, Bulls, and Bears each got a new coach, two of them black, one Latino. Millennium Park was emerging from the big mud pit on Michigan Avenue, an urban playground that felt both a part of downtown and a world away. In a basement on the south side, Kanye West was producing beats, practicing rhymes, dreaming new layers in hip hop. In another basement, not far from there, a Senate campaign was underway, and a local politician named Barack Obama was about to become a national icon. I loved the thousands of trees and flowers that the mayor had planted. I loved the way the sun played off the lake on a cold winter day. 
I loved the Russian Jews and Pakistani Muslims who spent Thursday afternoons on the park benches on Devon Avenue. I loved the women who filled the corridor between O'Hare Airport and the Blue Line back to the city with gospel songs. I thought about Louis Armstrong st stopping to listen to a group of jazz musicians who were playing strutting with some barbecue. Man, you're playing that too slow, he told them. How would you know, one of them asked scornfully. I'm Louis Armstrong. That's my <laughs> chorus you're playing. The next day, he walked by the same corner and the musicians had hung up a sign, pupils of Louis Armstrong. <laughs> jazz got educated in this town. The blues went electric here, and one of the originals, Buddy Guy, still played a show almost every night of the week during the month of January at his club, Legends. I went back to my old barber, an Iraqi who had been forced to fight in Saddam Hussein's army in the Gulf War and was given asylum in the United States. His son came bounding up as he threw the smock around my shoulders. The boy wanted to show his father some new trick on his Game Boy. My God, I told Amir, is that Dexter? He was three the last time I saw him, shy, still a toddler. Now he had a head of thick, wavy hair and eyes set off by long Arab eyelashes. I asked Dexter about school, about his grandparents. Next thing I knew, my hair was done. Hey, Ibu, it was a black girl's voice, soft but not shy. I was munching on a falafel sandwich made by the Palestinian grocer near El Cuarto Año, where I had my first teaching job. You don't remember me, she asked, her voice playful. It's Roxanne. You were my teacher second semester, right here, she said, gesturing toward the school building. I got my GED. I got a job now, and my son's doing real good. He's in preschool. I woke up one morning and took my Chicago Tribune out of its blue wrapper, and there was a story that brought me nearly to tears. Daniel Barenboim, the conductor of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, an Argentinian Israeli maestro, had shown up at a student assembly at a school in the Palestinian territories and played the piano. Simply brought his gift to a group of students who are given too little, communicating that they too were worthy of beauty. Kevin and I got off the red line at the Fullerton stop. Do you remember what I said to you here five years ago, he asked me. I told you I was dropping out of college, that I was going to work on my poetry. I asked you if you thought I could make it as a poet. I remember my best friend, Kevin Colville, had just been asked to be a part of HBO's Deaf Poetry Jam. He had been making his living as a poet for a couple of years now. He was working on a new piece about Chicago. He wanted to read it to me here at the Fullerton stop. The people who organized the mayor's annual leadership prayer breakfast heard about the Interfaith Youth Corps and invited me to give the Muslim prayer at the event. Somehow, I got seated next to the mayor. Are you Indian, he asked. I said, yes. My daughter just spent six months in Kerala, he told me. For the next 20 minutes, the mayor and I talked about India. When the waiter came around to pour him more coffee, Mayor Daly said, no thanks, Oscar. I stared at him. How did the mayor of Chicago know the name of the guy who pours coffee at the Hilton Towers? He shrugged and said, he and I went to grade school together. Home, the place where your barber doesn't have to ask what to do with your hair, where the music you love came of age, where the leading citizens fill you with pride, where your best friend's dreams are coming true, where your former students recognize you on the street. Home, the piece of earth that your hands have, shall, have helped shape. Thanks, Ibu. <laughs> Chicago crowd, Alisa. Yeah, I told you that was going to go over well. Um, so we're going to open it up to the floor now for questions from you all. I just want to remind you that you have to talk into the mic. And um, someone, who's going to be? Um, oh, OK, who has the mic? OK, so there's a question right here. Go ahead. Can you say who your name is, too? Uh, Susan Gray, and I'm from Chicago for the last 20 years, anyway. Uh, you talked earlier about when you were in your 20s or 18 or so, and you, 
had this rage, you went through that period of rage, and you got in with this group of, of students who were very radical, and after a, a couple of weeks, you said to yourself, the rage is not the answer. I mean, you, you seem to separate yourself from them. Uh, at least that's what I got from what you were saying. And I'm wondering, what was it that made you, or do you have a feel for why did you realize that the rage was not the answer okay. when so many other people continue in that, you know, with, with le and let the rage right. run their life? Right. Well, thank you for that question. Um, in, in, in this book, I call this coming to the crossroads of your identity crisis. When you're asking yourself, who am I in the world? What is my identity? And what is my impact going to be? And I think that a lot of young people come to that, the crossroads of that identity crisis. And what matters is who meets them there. And so when some young Muslims in Europe come to the crossroads of that identity crisis, there is and unfortunately, this network of nefarious uh, Muslim con men who meet them there and say, here is what the answer is to your rage of being marginalized by British society or by German society. You have to purify yourself in this perverted notion of Islam, and you have to kill others and yourself. That's the only way for you to be whole again. Right? And that has everything to do with the sociological fact of the people and institutions that meet you at that crossroads. I was very lucky. I was blessed in the sense that the people who met me at that crossroads were the, uh, the legacy of Dorothy Day, um, the person of Brother Wayne Teasdale, so many of the people who are my Muslim mentors now, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And they, in effect, said, listen, you are part of a lot of great traditions. America is a great tradition. Islam is a great tradition. India is a great tradition. And your job is to figure out how to live that tradition, its core values, in today's day and age. And that's, that's a lot of what we try to do at the Interfaith Youth Corps, is to say, when young people who are seeking that identity, who want to make a powerful impact, who have enormous potential for good, why isn't there a whole generation of people who are helping nurture them towards an identity that is committed to pluralism and to compassion and to justice. And that's a ton of our work at the Interfaith Youth Corps. Thank you. OK, there's some questions over maybe here. Oh, here, you're giving the mic. OK, I guess he. My name's Howard oh, Court. Oh, you know what? OK, go ahead. Just him first. Go ahead. And I'm, uh, I represent Jewish Voice for Peace. Um, last summer, there was something called Cafe Finjan. It was on Chicago Avenue. I forget which uh, cafe it was in, but it was sort of a Jewish Muslim mm -hmm. other gathering. And uh, people, they had an open mic. A group of Muslims went to the back and prayed on their knees. Uh, there was terrific interaction between local Jews, Muslims, and others. And somehow there was only one time, and I kept checking in. Is there going to be another one? And nobody could answer it, and there wasn't another one. And wouldn't that be great to start something like that again? Great. Good. So yeah, there's you know, the answer. Th yeah, thank you for that. And actually, a lot, of, a lot of the people, I'm so proud to say that a lot of the people who organize that are friends of mine, people like Rami Nashashibe at the Inner City Muslim Action Network and Kevin Colville, who I write about in this book, folks at JCUA, folks at CARE Chicago. So that, you know, there is this movement growing of young people from different religious backgrounds who are inspired by their faith to build the big idea of pluralism. And I just, I can't tell you how blessed I feel to be a part of that movement at this point in history. Because I, I think that if we get it right, it could be the story of the 21st century. So thank you for the work you do. And it's good to see you guys from JCUA. Can I also just remind everyone to just keep their questions short just so that we can give everybody a chance to ask? OK, a brief one. Uh, I, I was also taken as the first uh, uh, questioner was with your talk about how you were in a state of rage as a teenager or thereabouts. Um, and uh, unlike the young Muslim people you were talking about, I'm an elderly American and I'm still stuck in a state of rage at the state of the world. Uh, uh, and I'm concerned uh, that uh, 
many of the folks that are sort of very high up in the world's religions are on the wrong side of this demarcation you've been talking about. And uh, what do we do about that? Well, actually, I'm not sure if, if, if that's the case. Um, I actually have a lot of admiration for a lot of our religious leaders in the world. Um, that doesn't mean I agree with them all the time, but I think that, that oftentimes, that sometimes they take courageous and important stands. But think about the Pope's recent uh, remarks about other religions. Sure. I, I have to tell you that if the Pope, as, as uh, the Catholic Pope, thinks that his religion is the most right and the most true, it doesn't surprise me. <laughs> and and I, I have to tell you something else also. I, I'm a Muslim, and I think my religion is the most right and the most true. And if, 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 it, if I didn't, I, why wouldn't I be a Buddhist? Now, here's, I think, the, the beautiful messiness of the world, that all of us can think that our different religions are the most right and the most true, and still make common cause with people who are different. And I, that's, that's the possibility that, that's before us. And, and you know, at the Interfaith Youth Corps, uh, we have a lot of evangelical Christians on staff who have a very different idea of who Jesus is than I do as a Muslim, who have a very different idea, perhaps, of what salvation means. Um, and we make common cause together on the big idea of bringing young people from different faith backgrounds together. That's what we can do positively and proactively. And I guess in the great tradition of Chicago and American pragmatism, I'm far more interested in thinking, how do we solve the problem of people from different religions in serious conflict. I think the answer to that is not by getting everybody to think that all religions are equal or that all religions are the same. I think the answer to that is by getting people who have profoundly different ideas of heaven to be able to build a better earth together. Um, okay, there's, I'm gonna make a little bit of a cue. So there's one here, one here, and one here, okay? Thank you, I really appreciated that talk. It was lovely. I was struck particularly what you said about personality and transformation, how key personalities affect transformations. What kind of personality does it take to transform the totalitarians, and have you ever seen that happen? That's a great question. And, and again, the way that we understand total, religious totalitarians at the Interfaith Youth Corps is as a very, very, very small group. Okay? And one of the reasons we work with young people is precisely because we think that they're a group that is not only enormously powerful, but that is seeking a clear identity. So I don't necessarily think that an 18-year-old who gets caught up in, in the swirl of, uh, of a religious totalitarian movement is a totalitarian for life. I am saying, well, why aren't we, first of all, trying to, to work with that 18-year-old earlier to have them understand their religious identity as one that is committed to and contributes to pluralism. And even if at the beginning stages of their involvement with something that is that, that tends towards something destructive, they are not lost. They are not lost. And, and, and part of the, the way I know this is because I taught for two years in Chicago uh, young people who had dropped out of school, oftentimes who had been involved in gangs or were still involved in gangs, who had come back for their GEDs. And I gotta tell you, if I didn't believe in that kind of redemption, and you can think about that in a secular way or a religious way, if I didn't believe that people could change, then I wouldn't be here. You know? um, so I, I deeply believe that people can change. I particularly believe that young people can change. And I think that, that we have to be creating cultures and institutions that, are, that have the ability to, to nurture that change. Thanks for your question. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I'm Nazneen Patel, and I am the youth that I think you're speaking to because I am caught in that, that crossroads of an identity crisis. And I, um, I'm wondering, what, where, is there a place for someone like me who grew up in a Muslim background as well and who has this very deep set Muslim identity, mm -hmm. but who isn't necessarily practicing the faith, who doesn't necessarily know if that's where I'm going to be in you know, 10 years down the road like you. Um, is there something that I can contribute in the Interfaith Youth Corps? Is there a, is there a place for a voice like mine? And um, oh, look, re related to that question also, um, aren't, the, aren't the youth that are involved in the Interfaith Youth Corps, aren't they sort of a self-selecting group? Like, aren't they, I mean, like when you think about organizations um, similar, like Seeds for Peace or 
things like that, where, you know, it was kind of like this self-selecting group. They have this moment of, you know, epiphany when they're working with each other and they realize Jews are good and Muslims are good and we can do good things together. But then they go home and it just kind of, you know, dissipates. Right. So what, how can you sustain that? Okay. I think those are great questions. I'm going to take the second one first. The way the Interfaith Youth Corps works is we think what matters is what happens when young people go home. In other words, we don't run programs in kind of a traditional sense of the term. We're not a 21st century YMCA. We're an organization that identifies and recruits and trains young people to be what we call architects of the cathedrals of pluralism. So the big idea is that young people in our generation need to have the skills and the knowledge in order to build concrete projects of, that bring young people from different religious communities together. And a huge part of what we do at the Interfaith Youth Corps is run training programs on college campuses, in cities, and in religious communities that get, train young people with those skills. So a lot of people say, I don't really know enough about religion to, to be able to bring people from different backgrounds together. And we say, great, we, ha we have a way that will teach you the shared values that all different religions have. How Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, etc., secular humanism, speak to hospitality, compassion, mercy. We'll train you in the organizing skills to bring young people together to do a concrete project around that value and then facilitate a dialogue that allows young people to share what it is from their own religious background that inspires them to do that. And a lot of this material, as I said before, is on ifyc.org. So we just have a, we have a, a different model of how to build an organization. And the model is you view young people as what the Ashoka Foundation calls social entrepreneurs. And they're the ones who are creating the cathedrals of pluralism. We are the core, the C-O-R-E, that is identifying and recruiting and training those young people. And that's why this is a movement, right? Um, so that's, I think that, that's, that's the answer to, to your second question. An interesting metaphor for this, I think, is people say to me all the time, well, aren't you just preaching to the choir? And I'm saying, no, we're doing two other things. First of all, we're teaching the choir to sing. There, right now, there's a bunch of people gathered in a cathedral that say, we want to be about pluralism, but we don't know what the language is. We don't know how people from different backgrounds, particularly different religious backgrounds, can talk to each other. The only religious language that, that's out there is this highly divisive language. So the first thing we're doing is teaching the choir to sing. The second thing we're doing is we're training each of those people to be choir directors and go off and start their own choirs. And that's why we have a lot of hope for this being a major movement in the 21st century. What role can you play? If you're committed to pluralism, whether you're religious or not, whether you, what, whatever your relationship with your faith background might or might not be, we want you to be involved. We have to, we have to be building a pluralism that, that takes religious identity seriously, but that does not marginalize non-religious people. So thank you for who you are and your question, and God willing, we'll work together. Um, first of all, I'd like to, to thank both of, uh, both of you. And I, I think in some ways, after listening to um, this conversation, I stand in the middle between Lisa and, and Ibo in terms of what I'm actually agreeing with. Um, in the sense that I, I think, Lisa, some of the points that you are raising is the idea that religion can often be seen as rigid and often be seen as having an, an answer in some ways. And that's kind of the question I'd like to, to pose to you. Um, Ibo, I, I come from both being religious and being progressive and being lots of full of rage all the time um, and try and use it in terms of teaching. And I think that one of the points that I'm having trouble believing you with is the fact that you're not recognizing the idea of structures and power that are often behind religion or that religion will often use. And that what religion can often provide when you're at that crossroads is an answer. And an answer when you're searching. But I'm wondering that when you have an answer, does that still leave room for questions? And particularly when you have structures, money, power, authority, groups you can belong in, clubs you can belong in, and clubs that take you going on golf courses or not, whether the religious pluralism can respond to that. OK, thank you for that question. I'm going to answer that in two layers. The first is the pragmatist layer. You are right. The structures, the money, the institutions, the layers, they're all there concretely in a sociological way. Pragmatically, is that going to be dismantled anytime soon? No. So which direction do you want it to go in? Would you prefer that the Catholic work with its massive structures around the world tended in the direction of totalitarianism or pluralism? 
I would prefer that it tends in the direction of totalitarianism. And, I, and I, I'm most interested in spending my time in working with that structure so that it, it stands firmly on that ground. But, but if we get to a conversation about why, about the power of those structures, I mean, in, in my mind, that's a given. There are structures. They have power. What are those structures being used for? I'll give you a great example of this. A lot of Catholic universities in America or Catholic schools were first founded for Catholics to not only nurture a Catholic identity, but in effect to protect a Catholic identity against what might have been viewed as the corrosiveness of the broader culture. You know what? Not far down the street is uh, a Catholic university, DePaul University, which is the place that, that educates perhaps more first-generation college students than any other university in Chicago, possible exception of UIC. Right? Many of the, the most important Muslim scholars in the country are at Catholic universities. John Esposito, who hired Tariq Ramadan from Europe, Notre Dame. Right? So here is a massive structure that at one point was probably not, it was certainly not totalitarian in the sense that I use it narrowly here, in the dangerous way I use it here, but might have been insular, that has since opened up and, and, and taken a firm stand on the side of pluralism. I guess what I'm thinking is, I think that that's fantastic, and I would love to spend my life encouraging religious institutions to do that, instead of you know, doing what, what some of the people who I know and love do, which is browbeating them for being religious in the first place. You know, I'll, I'll tell you just a personal story which kind of illuminates this. It's very important to my wife and I to have a Muslim wedding. And it was also very important to us to have a wedding that uh, affirmed who we are as, as people in 21st century America, as people who are, are uh, progressive in many ways, uh, as, uh, uh, in a situation that was celebratory for our family. So we asked one of my personal heroes from South Africa, Imam Farid Essak, who is currently, uh, I think, teaching at Harvard right now. Um, we asked him to officiate at our wedding. And my wife, um, who rolls her eyes sometimes at things in religion and in other matters that she doesn't like very much, she said, well, listen, we're not going to have X, Y, and Z in this Muslim wedding. We're just not going to do it, right? So I was playing shuttle diplomacy between my wife and Imam Farid. And Farid's like, let me tell you something, Ibu. I'm a progressive imam, but I engage a 1,400-year-old tradition, and I do not play fast and loose with that tradition. If you don't want a Muslim wedding, don't have a Muslim wedding. If you want a Muslim wedding, we need to talk about what I, as an imam and a scholar of this tradition, believes is essential to have as a Muslim wedding. Otherwise, you're free not to have a wedding to have a Muslim wedding. So, I mean, one is free to not be religious. One is free to be religious in ways that one wants to be. One is free to have whatever type of relationship they want with a tradition. But I think it's important to engage that tradition, just as I think it's important to engage the national tradition that is America, the literary tradition that is uh, memoirs, the, the ethnic and national tradition that is India. And, and I think that there, I am concerned that so much discourse these days is only telling the negative story of religion. I mean, it's as if bin Laden and the Islamophobes are reading from the same talking points. Bin Laden says, Islam can only be violent. And some Islamophobe writes a book that says, Islam can only be violent. Right? Totalitarians are saying, my religion is going to suffocate you. Secularists are saying, your religion is going to suffocate me. It just seems to me that there is a dramatic, not only middle ground, but different dimension that 99% of us stand on, which is people from different backgrounds and different beliefs can live together in equal dignity and mutual loyalty, even if they have different epistemologies and ontologies. Um, I think we only have really room for two more questions. There was one back here, um, Barbara, and also one back here, and um, then we can continue to talk informally. But Hi, I want to thank you all for, for the conversation, and I. Um, hate that we don't have more time for this because a lot of complex questions and issues are embedded in this. And I guess I just want to say, um, Ibu, you know, I sort of come from a similar background, although clearly different generation, in that I became politicized from some radical nuns in Detroit uh, who were very involved in liberation theology many, many, I won't say how many years ago, a long time ago. <laughs> Uh, but they were always embattled with the church because they were also feminists and eventually left the church. Um, and I, those, those very same people, myself included, um, 
developed a different kind of faith and have a different trajectory of faith than, than I think what you're describing, which is faith in humanity. And I think that um, that kind of faith really has fueled some of the most powerful social movements um, in the world. I mean, from South Africa, young people in the streets of Soweto, they listened to Bishop Tutu, but it was a secular movement. Feminists all over the world who fought you know, fem uh, female genital mutilation and a whole number of other atrocities have deliberately grounded themselves um, in a secular vision of the world, the trade union movements all over the world that have, you know, risen number of people out of poverty from, you know, Asia to this country, you know, have been decidedly secular. So for me, it's, and, and religion inspires some people and other things inspire other people. And so I think really uh, it's not so much a question of dividing, a divide between faith and lack of religious faith, but people who believe in social justice and a better kind of world. Now that's where I come, I have a problem with, the, with what I think is a kind of simple solution of pluralism. Because that suggests to me, and nobody's against it, it's like peace, but peace on what terms? It's like love, but in the interest of what? Um, pluralism to me suggests a sort of you know, togetherness and tolerance, which is fine. But it's not enough, because ultimately in a society we have to make choices. For example, someone's religion might um, demand that they prevent someone else from uh, having an abortion. I mean, that's a critical issue uh, with people with very differing views on either side, and society has to decide. So if you are someone who has a deep religious conviction that this is murder, that religion, if you're true to it, that religious belief, if you're true to it, is gonna lead you to interfere with my belief as a feminist that women ought to have control over their own bodies. So ultimately, that's a political choice that pluralism doesn't address, and there's a whole long list of those kinds of very important moral choices that pluralism doesn't satisfy. So I think I'm not arguing with you about pluralism. I think it's fine. But if we see pluralism as some sort of solution to social injustice, I think it's, it's woefully inadequate. Right. Well, as always, I'm, I'm struck by, by what you say. Um, two just quick rejoinders. One is, uh, is the battle between pro-life folks and uh, pro-choice folks going to take place on the streets or in the courts? That's the difference between... between both. Right. Yeah. And the people like Eric Rudolph, which is who I begin this book with, who bombs the Olympics and bombs uh, a health clinic, who he is a totalitarian, right? So he is, because what he is saying that his set of beliefs are going to be put into action in a way that, that actively hurts other people. But people who have a pro-life pro viewpoint, who vote that way, who uh, argue their cases in court, they're not only a part of our society, they're like 50% of our society. And either we, we figure out how to relate to them, that doesn't mean we agree with them, or you agree with them, but one has to figure out how to live with people of profoundly different backgrounds. And I just, unless one is gonna say, I'm setting a, you know, I'm breaking Florida off from the, from the continent and all the progressives are gonna go there and the rest of the people with different ideas are gonna live here. I don't know another option other than people with vastly different viewpoints are gonna to have to, to learn to live together. So that's just a quick, quick way of thinking on, on the kind of the, the specific case that you brought up. My second response is to the idea of pluralism. Um, I do think that it's relatively simple. I also do think that it's a huge answer, and let me just define it very quickly in, in, a, in, in a, 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 a slightly more layered way. I think a pluralist society has three major components. One is respect for and freedom of identity. Identity groups are generally respected and they're generally free to express themselves. Number two, there are positive relationships between different groups in a society. Number three, there is some sort of commitment to the broader common good. Even if that, and, and that broader common good tends to transcend political difference. So no matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat in the armed forces, whoever gets elected in, in, in 2008 and takes office in 2009 will probably not be the victim of a military coup because the Republicans and Democrats in the armed services have made a decision that they are going to, they're, they're going to be committed to the higher common good of the American electoral process. And that's, I guess, I am making a set of uncomfortable choices in a very dangerous world. And my choice is that pluralism, I think, has to be, for me, a higher value than other things that I happen to value. 
because I just don't see any other option. And I think that the dangers of not affirming pluralism, affirming a world where people from different backgrounds live together, dramatically different backgrounds, dramatically different viewpoints, is allowing a much more dangerous force to have sway. And, and I imagine we're going to have a lot of conversations on this. <laughs> All right, one last question. My comment has to do with plural, pluralism, and I think that uh, you've made some very strong points, uh, positive points about that. Uh, I was wondering about your interfaith youth group, and I'm thinking, uh, are they considered sort of uh, gatekeepers for this uh, concept of the, a plural society? Is that your idea about how we can uh, make sure that we do have a plural society. Uh, I don't think I want to be a gatekeeper for anything. Um, we think that one of the keys to m building pluralism is a vanguard role for young people. And that's why we started the Interfaith Youth Corps in 1998. That's why we do trainings on college campuses. That's why we organize the Days of Interfaith Youth Service. Uh, that's why we uh, work closely with other interfaith youth organizations, religious communities, campuses because we would like to play our role in taking the people in the choir and having them sing this song and then helping them become choir directors. So we just want to play a role. That's it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ibu. <laughs> Acts of Faith. Ibu Patel is founder and executive director of the Interfaith Youth Corps. The organization was created to build respect among young people with different religious backgrounds. 